Welcome to A Professor's Life, the fortnightly webcast for all things academia. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Stephen. Stephen. And Robert. Hello. <laughs> this is a new show for us that focuses on life inside the hallowed halls of academia. We'll cover all aspects of academic life from being an undergrad all the way to that coveted position of tenured fool and beyond, if there is a beyond. Yeah, we sure come, Yeah, there probably is a beyond. We come from uh, different academic backgrounds and different types of institutions, so we hope that you're looking forward to joining us in a conversation about all things life in the so-called ivory tower. So, um, just before we get started, we'd like to let everyone know that, as always, the views expressed in this show are not our own. No, wait, they are our own. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, why are uh, yours? That's a terrible slip up. Yeah. I don't so, have views. all of our views are our own and not necessarily <laughs> represent our institutions. So that's our that's our CYA that we have to do for a, a show. It's about our own profession. I, I don't know. I mean, you could be paid off by somebody. We're not quite sure. Uh, we'll see how that works out. <laughs> well. Yeah, I mean, sure. I, I, I'm, I'm relatively inexpensive. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's an academic life for you. Yeah, so we have, we have no sponsors, and that just sort of we shows can't you. be bought. <laughs> <laughs> can't be bought. That's our, our blatant ass for sponsors. So um, we thought we'd take the first episode or part of the first episode just to introduce ourselves, so our listeners can get a chance to uh, know a little bit about ourselves. Uh, I will get started. Uh, I'm Chris, and I am in the field of physics. Uh, I've been a professor at uh, in a tenure track job for about 11 years. I just finished up my 11th year now, and I have worked in regional comprehensives, and I am currently at a residential, small, private liberal arts college. All right. I'll take the next stab, I guess. Uh, so I'm the same amount of time. I graduated, uh, I guess, 11 years ago. Uh, I'm in my second job, my first job, or both jobs are in Carnegie One Research Institutions, both large public uh, universities. Uh, I, oh, yeah, I'm in a uh, business school. I probably should have mentioned that part at the front end, uh, management specifically, I guess. Okay, I'm, I guess I'm the newbie. Uh, I'm in my ninth year, and uh, both at state public schools, my field is entrepreneurship, and I am non-tenure track. All right, so we have a different mix of perspectives of uh, here for folks. So I um, hope that everyone listening can find something that they can relate to. Uh, speaking of relating to something, this is something I think everybody in academia can relate to. Uh, the show's topic today is finding a job. Jobs. Pay. Job. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you're this, uh, you're this young academic in graduate school. Maybe you've graduated, maybe you haven't, and you are thinking about finding a tenure track job. And so we thought we would share our experiences in the job search and um, open up the discussion. So, uh, Stephen, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, I guess I would be, in some respects, the, I don't know, it was, it was a good, good path for me. Um, I originally started coming out of grad school looking for jobs. Uh, my field theoretically was flush with jobs. Um, historically, it had been flush with jobs. I, however, was coming right out uh, in a recessionary time or the lagged recessionary time you'd have in an academic setting, which meant uh, although I was one of the more attractive brand new candidates on the field, um, I got two interviews. Uh, that's a bad, bad year for, for what we were looking for. Uh, of the two interviews, I went to both places. One place told me that uh, they've interviewed two people. I was one of them, and they were going to hire a woman. Uh, for those of you who are um, not watching this, you may not realize that I am not a woman. Uh, so I was basically granted to not get that job. The other place uh, actually had a very linear process. They said, we're going to bring in one candidate. We like them. We hire them. If we don't like them, we go to the next candidate. Uh, and so they brought me in for the job. They offered me the job and I took the job. Um, in that situation, I know I had a, because it wasn't the best year ever and I went to a good school, but I won't think it was considered to be a top 25 school in our field. Uh, my advisor told me I should not take the job. In fact, I should consider waiting another year. Uh, I, on the other hand, wanted to get married have income coming in as opposed to the non-existent income that comes with grad school. Um, and, you know, again, start to prove myself. 
so I went in, took that first job. And after a couple of years, I guess the, the idea for me was that it wasn't the perfect place for me. Great people, love the place from that perspective, um, love the culture of the place. But ultimately, I was looking for a little bit something different, um, sort of a better fit with my research and um, different location, better fit with uh, where my wife's family was. Uh, so I went on a job search. That took three years, I guess, to find the place that I'm at now. Um, one side was I was given offered some jobs along the way, but none of them were the perfect fit for me uh, because I had a job and because I was um, pretty comfortable where I was. And it wasn't a place I was scared of or I hated or anything about it. Uh, I turned down some jobs that, that were even better paying, waiting for that right job for me. Uh, unfortunately, I think where I'm at now is, is a fantastic location. I'm very happy there. Uh, and I've not searched for jobs since I've been here. So and like I said, in, in many respects, this could be considered to be, uh, at a very macro level, a great path, very well uh, effective path to this. I mean, I can get down to the nitty gritty if we want to come back around to that or if you have questions or thoughts about that. But I looked for jobs. I got the job I really wanted you know, it's sort of best case scenario, I would say. Well, I, I, I would add that where you are in the path, I mean, Stephen's now a full tenured professor with a fellowship. Yeah. So that would be your, your question, Chris, are we hit, you know, tenured and beyond, I guess the, uh, or full professor and beyond, I, I, I see it like as three sets of three ranks or two sets of three ranks. So you have your, uh, assistant associate full, and then you've got your fellow, uh, chair and professorship or is it professorship and chair? I don't know. I'm at fellow. I'm at step one. And chair. Okay. Yeah. Professorship mm -hmm. and then chair. So I'm at step one of the next set of, uh, rankings. Oh, see, we don't have beyond. Professors. Okay. Yeah. There's a couple of endowed chairs at my institution, but <clears throat> it's not like, and you can get them, you can earn them. Don't get yeah. me wrong. But yeah. I don't really see that as rank beyond. Okay. There's pretty much the full is the terminal. Okay. So they, they really do treat it as you should be, you know, there's the opportunity to start accruing these other ranks once you've become a, a full professor. So the fellowship, which is what I'm on or what I've received, uh, comes with some research funds. Um, and then the professorship would come with more research funds and perhaps some money into your actual base salary. And then a, a, an endowed chair would have both of those, but in larger quantities. Um, but all that comes from, from the institution has actually set standards of a chair is this amount of endowment it has to throw off this amount of money per year. Um, so everything is set up that way. So they have comparisons from college to college in many respects on what the labels are. Um, so a fellow would mean this and has this value. Now there's, it's a bracket. It, it, you know, there is a difference. So one fellowship may be better than a different fellowship. Um, and depending on how old some of these things are, a fellowship may be actually more valuable than a, uh, a, uh, a professorship if the professorship is old and it was in before some of the standards came along well that's a nice thing though because it's actually addresses something and i don't want to get too far off the show's topic but this is a pretty free form show <laughs> so, so uh, uh something i've definitely personally struggled with over the last year or so is sort of okay i'm getting to be full professor right and as long as everything works out in less than a week I should have that. So uh, as long as the votes go through. By <laughs> uh, so uh, the now what? Right. So, you know, you, that's it. You got your last uh, sort of rank at this particular institution. There's no more carrots. There's only sticks. Mm -hmm. so yeah, because you're also department head. Right. Right. And that's not really a promotion. No, that, no that's, that's more of a stick. Right. That's a stick. <laughs> and so um, – I've spent a lot of time this last year sort of thinking about five-year plans. You know, where do I want my career to go? Because I'm not interested in the, uh, the only variety coming from the occasional new class or, oh, guess what committee I'm serving on this? <laughs> this year? You know, that, I don't want my variety, which boils down to ultimately the variety being what committee am I serving on this year? Right. Right. <laughs> um, that's just not what I would find fulfilling. So I've been thinking very seriously about, I wouldn't call them long-term plans, but certainly short to mid-range plans where, where, where do I want the career to, what direction do I want the career to go in? Otherwise I'm worried about getting stuck in a, a rut or a loop mm -hmm. 
of just doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, so that's a that's a sidetrack. I just want to thought I brought that up because I thought that's a very nice way of addressing what do you do with your faculty after they've reached full. Right. So it is you know it's, you can think about the pathing and you can think about you know again not all these things are created equal. We actually have somebody in our department who has two um, endowed chairs. So he is the only person in the college, I believe, with two endowed chairs because that's the ranking on top of the ranking because he is so successful, I guess, that they gave him the extra uh, the extra chair. Um, and as an aside, we can think about and discuss later on uh, or perhaps on a future episode some other things we can fit with this. How do you keep yourself relevant? Um, you know, I have a center I started a year ago. That's another way to, you know, to find a, a play thing, as it were. Right. Um, but we'll, we'll leave it at that for now. That would be excellent because that's probably relevant to my plan too. So, all right, uh, Robert, how about? Uh, oh, my crazy path. Here. Yeah, your crazy path. Yeah, so <laughs> I was part of a dual career search, which is also its own weird thing. Uh, my wife is also an academic, so she was done and was kind of hanging out at the school she graduated from, waiting for me to finish. Um, so I forced my PhD, I guess, kind of short circuited it, which has got pros and cons. I got done in early uh, <laughs> for my program a year early, um, but it doesn't mean I also didn't have the research stream you normally would have. Uh, I wanted to get on the job market, kind of like Stephen, you know, had a spouse, had things to do, was getting bored, needed to move on. Um, started looking around, interviewed for uh, quite a smattering of different jobs, everything from jobs in medical schools where I was also thinking of, you know, what the hell, I collect degrees, I may as well go get an MD while I'm there, to uh, traditional tenure track jobs, to uh, clinical professor jobs, which are kind of non-tenure track jobs, um, everything, all over the map. Uh, I had a, God, so many interviews, I don't even remember how many, less than 20, more than 15, so uh, quite a lot. I was flying around all over the place. Um, ended up getting the position I got sort of in a backdoor way, um, got a phone call while on vacation from a crazy British dude who <laughs> ended up being uh, the director of one of the research centers at the school I ended up at. And he was so wildly entertaining on the phone that I pretty much said, you know, honey, we're, we're going to the school because I got to work with this guy. He's insane, uh, which ended up being true. Yeah. Wonderfully insane bomb thrower hell of a lot of fun to work with <laughs> mm. probably would have been a bitch to work for um or against just, yeah or oh yeah no it was a nightmare um but he was great uh so i ended up at the same school that steven ended up coming to um two years i think after i got there Sounds about right. i can't remember one or two yeah that'd be two years um as what they called a, an assistant clinical professor so non-tenure track phd position um but with a fixed term, longer path. Yeah. yeah. So essentially it was three to five year contracts. Uh, downside is you can never get tenure. Upside is every three years you can go back up to market rate. So that's kind of the difference there. Also, you can do as much outside consulting pretty much as you want or things for overload pay because they don't, the cons there's traditionally a concern that tenure track professors will get tenure, you know, do nothing and turn it into a paid consulting gig on the side. Um, so they have all these restrictions on what you can do. Clinicals rarely have any of that because you can be fired at will. I mean, you don't do the job, you're out on your ass. Uh, um, worked my way up, became a director of one center, then two centers, then three centers, then four centers. Uh, so I was doing my job and also being an administrator. Uh, just recently went out on the job market again. Um, and we'll be starting a new job in what, two months? Um, Getting kind of, you know, in my field, at least in entrepreneurship, you know, the the, the holy grail. I've got the endowed uh, chair. Uh, so I'm now a full professor with an endowed chair. Um, still not on tenure track. Still doing my own thing, which is kind of great. Um, so it was a very odd, especially since the second time I went out. Um, I think Stephen might have been on cycle both times for your field. Yeah. Mainly in the summer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and uh, traditionally in business, because we're both in business, the the main cycle is during the summer, the year before. Mm -hmm. 
So we have our big academy meeting. There's lots of interviews there. That's when most of the jobs get posted. And then you're usually hired a, you know, six months to nine months before your job even starts. Yeah. So, so usually the, the job offers range from October to February in that yeah. range. Yeah. But this time I was off cycle. So I didn't even start till around Christmas time. Um, so way off cycle, which is a completely different market. Uh, you find different jobs, the strange jobs, the ones where people have retired <laughs> or moved to another institution last second or something either got funded or didn't get funded or didn't fill or someone backed out. So it's kind of this weird secondary market, um, which was quite a bit of a challenge because you're kind of on your own. You can't just rely on, well, I'll just go to the academy and, you know, um, look at the job postings. This was more of a call people up and scramble kind of a thing. Um, worked out, worked out great. Um, but it, it was a very odd experience. So, Definitely something I would only advocate anyone ever does if they already have a job. Mm-hmm. Um, because also, the <laughs> I just finally signed my last contract now and I start in two months. <laughs> For us, that is a really short fuse, mm-hmm. uh, which has its own transitioning and getting things moved and buying a house. Um, the whole thing that goes with the job search, unless it's next door. Right. Um, so, yeah. So my weird path ended up that way. So I'm no longer an administrator. I, I went from almost full-time administrator with my regular gig being the side job to now being back only responsible for myself. Um, and as uh, Stephen pointed out, it's kind of nice. I got the two piles of money coming mm-hmm. off the endowment that I can spend on pretty much anything I want. Uh, so it's a very different position. And people treat you very differently. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because I got the mantle of legitimacy now. And it's, it's interesting I've been involved in a lot of university politics as an administrator and just seeing the way people treat you with the different titles Mm -hmm. is, uh, at some schools, very titles are very meaningful. Others, not so much. They don't care, but at least at the state research, uh, schools seems to be a much bigger deal. Well, if they have, again, the, the set of rankings, you know, you, yeah. you climb up. And so after you yeah, hit the full, yeah. then yeah, I mean, that, that's, that is a big piece. Uh, we can say, oh, this person must have been here for a while or has done yeah. something beyond just lived long enough. Yeah. Um, well, that's the, that's the double-edged sword nature of the second set of rankings. Right. right. It can establish yeah. this culture of, uh, of uh, superiority, mm-hmm. uh, if, if you will. Um, my my path to a job is bizarre uh and and if we're a physicist it's extremely bizarre it starts actually all the way back to my undergrad days i didn't go straight to grad school i took a year and was a high school teacher because i thought that's what i wanted to do with my life and around october it became pretty clear that that was not what i wanted to do with my life and so (laughs) and so then (laughs) <laughs> the following year, I went to grad school. In between, by the way, that year, that summer, I taught kindergarten and first grade math. <laughs> oh, um, God, man. Yeah, I know. It's, most people what do I know, though? Yeah, most people that know me can't picture it. I still can't picture it. I did it. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, I uh, went into grad school with the express interest of teaching uh, a teaching focused career. And a lot of times, you know, you think physics, you think, you know, oh, well, if you're not doing scientific research in R1, then you're... Uh, I'm just sort of wasting your, your talent and your life away. Um, oh. <laughs> in fact, I was occasionally told that indirectly, not those exact words, but um, it did, I did run into that. So uh, I did the grad school thing. During grad school, I actually took a semester off to teach as a sabbatical replacement, which just does not happen in the sciences very often at all. Because, I mean, you're, you have like a, a, an advisor paying your way, right? And you're earning a stipend. And mm-hmm. so to take that time away. I had a very, very nice advisor who understood my career goals um, and was willing to let me do that. I had a lot of people try and talk me out of doing that actually while I was there. Um, And so then it was time to find a job. And like you guys, I had a spouse. I wanted to start making money. I wanted to, you know, move somewhere that I could possibly lay down roots or whatever the case might be. And so I started shooting for the tenure track jobs, which is also unusual in physics because you typically want to do a postdoc or mm-hmm. need to do a postdoc, sometimes five or six uh, with the current <laughs> market. Um, 
And so uh, I fell into a place that I think had started their search late. So it was sort of secondary market kind of thing. Mm. And I had two interviews. The first one didn't work out. And probably in the long run, it was good that it didn't work out. I was their second place candidate when all was said and done, but they wanted an experimentalist. I'm a theorist. That was pretty much the deciding factor. Perfectly fine. Um, this, uh, the place I ended up going, uh, I, they, were, they were searching. And I think I, I interviewed late in April, early May. Hmm. In fact, it was final exams week when I gave my talk. There's like no students there, you know? Crazy, um, yeah. And so it's that secondary job market kind of thing. Mm. Um, I got the job. And so I went straight into a tenure track position out of grad school, which is pretty uncommon uh, in my field. Um, and then I decided to, um, after four good years there, uh, I decided that I wanted to get closer to home. I was farther away from home. Uh, that I wanted to be and you know my wife had um, a couple of deaths in her family and it was pretty clear when you're nine hours by car you you know you, that's hard that's hard to do with the family thing and so we tried to get closer and sure enough the uh, current position I'm at had an opening and uh, current place I'm at had an opening and it was also off cycle <laughs> I think I gave my but students were actually on campus that time <laughs> The interesting thing, though, and as you both have pointed out, is when you're off cycle like that, especially if you already have a job, the whole interviewing experience is completely different. Mm -hmm. There's you're, You can be very laid back yeah. in the approach because I had in my previous institution, I had a career locked in. You know, mm -hmm. in fact, I was already promoted at that point. They did early promotions there, mm -hmm. true early promotions there. And so <clears throat> I was. Uh, I could have stayed and had no problems, right? So, I, but I wanted to get to a, uh, sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. <clears throat> I uh, wanted to get back to closer to home, but also I wanted to go back to the um, small liberal arts environment. I'm a product of a small private liberal arts college. Uh, I like that model of education. I wanted to get back into that model of education. And I just totally lucked out. I, my, I'll be the first to admit that my, my career path is, is, based on pure luck. I was lucky that probably the first place I was hired, I was it probably wasn't just late cycle, but it was probably at a failed search or something. I know they hired a chair that year. So had those things not lined up right, I probably would not have gotten that job without a postdoc, right? And then this particular position just opened, randomly opened up and um, worked out. I, you know, I, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't understand how lucky I was not to have the postdoc until years later. Well, there, there, you bring up two two points I think that that need to be talked about here. Um, the first part starts from the beginning of this, which is that you chose your path based on what you wanted to do, even with people, advisors or whoever it might be questioning it. Um, yeah, I think we definitely have to bring up the role of advisors. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, th I think it's really. It's rare, I think, for an advisor to let a PhD candidate choose the path that they want rather than the path that the advisor wants. The advisor generally, you know, you, you see this a lot, is that an advisor says, you should do like I do because what I've done is right because I did it. It must be the right decision. Um, like I said at the beginning of this, my advisor wanted me to go to a different place. And I think he thinks highly of the place I now am at. Uh, but I went the path that I wanted to do because I wanted to do it. Um, and I talked to, I, I know we go through the same process at, at our programs that students sometimes choose things based on family or location or community. They want to be at this kind of a space. Um, you know, so maybe they want to be in a big school. They want to be in a small school. They want to be in a liberal arts school versus they want to be in a, in a uh, large public, whatever it might be. Um, Whereas advisors and faculty writ large are often trying to say is you should go to a place just like us. Um, so or better. Or better, whatever it might be. Lateral uh, or up. Right. Yeah. Depending on whether or not some people think that there is an up. Uh, some people right. don't believe yeah. that there is up. Uh, yeah, yeah. Regardless, there's <laughs> many schools that may believe that they're at the top of whatever pile that, that may exist. Yeah. Um, so, so you need to have as – if you have a um, – if you're in that process right now when you're going through this – you want your advisor to 
you know, support whatever it is. And Chris, you're saying you, you had a great advisor who looked that way and, and said, do what, do what you want. Uh, and I think that's rare, but I think you also need to stand up for it because this is your career. You know, I've got, God, I've still got 30 years left in this career. You know, that's, that's 40 years in a job. If I let somebody else dictate it, I'm not going to be happy. Um, so, so I think that's a, an important factor to, to think about. Pick the place that you want because you have 40 years. And be, with 40 years, you still have the opportunity to change. You know, all yeah. of us have changed some way or another. And I think that's reasonable. Um, if you are doing the work that you should be doing, this is like any other job in the world. If you are overperforming, you're exceeding expectations in any dimension, there is a space for you. And you can be a jerk. I'm not advising it, but you can be a jerk. If you <laughs> exceed expectations, there are still jobs for you. We all know examples of that. Oh, yeah. But if you're a nice person and you exceed expectations, there are even more jobs for you. So you'll be able to find a path that works. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's interesting that you bring up the, the, the key role of the advisor because, you know, for example, I had, um, this was 2004 was my last year. I graduated uh, in May of 2004 with my PhD. And uh, that, this, that January, I went to a conference called Dynamic States. It's a small nonlinear dynamics conference. It happens every year. And I got really excited talking to a few people who were doing some stuff that was related to what I was doing at the time. And I came back to my advisor. I said, you know, I think I want to do a postdoc. I think I want to do this uh, research thing. And he looks at me and goes, really? Because didn't haven't you spent the entire last four or five years saying how much you want to be in a teaching position? He pretty much like talked sense into me <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to say, you know what? You had a great advisor. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Because he said, this is this is just you honeymoon period after a conference, essentially. Right. right? Yeah. You know, you're coming off. Yeah. Right. Coming up high off after a conference. And he's like, you know, come back down to earth. Think about what your goals are. This is what you've been doing. This is what you've been working for. You know, um, yeah. yeah. Excellent advisor. Absolutely excellent advisor. I didn't know how great of an advisor he was in terms of just the things that you pointed out, Stephen, mm -hmm. until after I talked to other people about their advising experiences right. from, you know, after I got out there in, in the world and started mm -hmm. talking about what other people experience. Mind you, an advisor has a lot of different roles, right? Right. You know, so from my perspective, my advisor was one of the best at training, you know, so for, I think he was a fantastic on how do you do research. I wanted to be a researcher, eventually decided that's what I wanted to be. Um, and he gave me all the skills to do that and be successful at it. And so, you know, from that perspective, it was a fantastic mentorship and he's won mentorship awards. Um, you know, but there was a still a statement of do like I do. Uh, which, you know, is a, was not the perfect environment. Um, you've got an advisor essentially who's saying, do like I do or don't do like I do, whatever works for you, which is really kind of a cool thing. If you provide all the skills and the training and you support the person to pursue what path they want, I mean, that's sort of a win all around. Yeah, my advisor was just someone who was willing to take pity on me and help me graduate um, because the guy who I was into the program to work with and was working with for years uh, ended up leaving involuntarily <laughs> from the institution. And, uh, so I was a little rudderous with like, will someone work with me, please I want to graduate. Um, and, and he was cool enough to help me along, but he didn't understand what I was doing. It was not his field. I mean, he was, he was strategy and I was strategy, but other than that, we were about as far on the spectrum of strategy researchers as you could possibly get. You know, I had done, 10 different preps as a grad student, you know, but, you know, teaching like crazy because, you know, what else was I going to do? Because I wasn't getting any research training. Um, so, yeah, my, my advisor was pretty much just like, well, whatever, dude, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll, I'll write your recommendations. Uh, and he was very cool, you know, given he, because he did, he took pity on me. And otherwise, I wouldn't have gotten to graduate if I didn't. If you don't have a chair, you're yeah. screwed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's he was always willing to serve. Yeah, there's always stories out there of like somebody whose who's advisor um, bailed on them, right? right? For whatever reason, they might change the institutions, whatever the case might be, and yeah. that that kills your that could potentially kill your job prospects right. unless somebody else sort of stands up for you and takes care of it. Uh, you know, to play off also something that Stephen pointed out, I guess I shouldn't say that I'm lucky to be. You know, I stumbled into things for sure. There's no mm -hmm. doubt, but I always had a plan, and I think if you're in the process, you're in graduate school right now. At, or even if you're not, if you're thinking about changing jobs, changing careers or whatever, plan, right? Uh, I took grad school as a job and I said, this is my end goal. 
and this is what I'm going to acquire the skill set that I need in order to get to this end goal. And not everybody does that. You know, there's different approaches to graduate school that lead to various degrees of success in finding mm -hmm. the job. And there's no guarantee. You can have a plan, a rock solid plan, and still not land a job. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially in today's market. There's no yeah. doubt. But if you go in thinking this is, you know, college part two. Oh, God, no. Yeah. You know, uh, as opposed to this is professional training for a career that you are, you know, about to enter, then, you know, you're going to have a tougher time. I mean, honestly, grad school is closer to um, getting a Ph.D. is closer to actually like apprenticing for a, being a plumber than it is like being an undergrad. Right. I mean, oh, it's definitely an apprenticeship system. Yeah. yeah. So you have to take it from that. Now, I will say um, I, I commend you for having a plan. Uh, I, I can't say that I had a plan when I entered grad school. In fact, I was my plan, you know, you're saying when you want to do this in, in undergrad, I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. When I was 13, I was going to be professor in uh, psychiatry. I was sure of it. I went to, to college for it. Uh, I was on that path. And between my junior year and senior year is about to create, create uh, applications for grad school in psychology. Um, I volunteered at a mental institution for a criminal, uh, for the criminally insane. After three months of that, I realized that that was not the path for me, uh, that I want to do something else entirely. And that's when suddenly, oh, my God, I got to do something. Uh, I have no job skills. I had a psych degree. Um, all of you who were looking around at yourself saying, yeah, I had a psych degree, too. It was fun. Uh, I had that. <laughs> but I had no job skills. Um, and so I applied to grad programs in the other thing in psychology that I liked, which is industrial organizational psychology. And didn't get into any of them because I hadn't planned for it. So now I'm scrambling like crazy. And just by sheer luck, uh, one of my mentors was dual uh, dual posting in, in multiple departments. Um, and he pulled my application out of psych department over to a business school and said, I think you might be a good fit over here. And that's where I ended up in my, my path. But I didn't know what it was. I mean, I honestly knew nothing about business other than the business of business is business. Um, you know, buy low, sell high. I I don't know anything else. <laughs> Father Guido would. Uh, yes, would yes. Father Guido Sarducci would help us out on this. Sell it for more. Right. Uh, <laughs> supply, demand. So, um, I didn't have a plan, and it wasn't until I actually had friends who were going through this. So as I you know entered grad school and saw others who went through it. And so I had some very good friends who were a couple years ahead of me. And I just started to emulate them. What were they doing? How did they get something? And so I I went that path. But I really think it was, for me, I didn't know what I really wanted until I was on a job. It's kind of like, I don't know what a house I want until I own the house. And I'm looking at my house now saying, not bad, but, um, yeah. you know, so, or, or in Robert's case, I guess, own seven houses and I don't know what I want. Um, so I think that's, a, that's an issue too, is that, you know, when you're 20 years old or whatever, trying 21 years old, 22 years old, trying to figure out what you want to do. And a lot of us go straight through. Um, not everybody, you know, and, and Robert's that oh, great case of going career. a different path. Right. Yeah. yeah third career um, or fourth. Uh, if you really want to be accurate, you're probably fourth or fifth. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it, when you're 22 or 21, figuring out what you want to do for the next 50 years of your life is hard. And figuring out that path of, well, I think I want to be, you know, even if you're saying I want to be in physics, do I want to be an experimentalist or, or theorist? Do I want to be researcher or do I want to be... Uh, teaching? Do I want to be what? That, that's a really hard thing to figure out at that point. And so I commend you, Chris, that you knew what you wanted to do and you had a path and you stuck to it. I mean, that's that's rare. Yeah, I have to say, I, I knew I wanted to be an astronomer since I was three. And then when I got into sixth grade, I said, you know what? Physics is more interesting. And to me. <laughs> oh, God. And so I wanted to be a physicist. And, and so when I did that year stint in high school, you know, I had my my professors like, what the hell are you doing? This is like not the Chris that we've known for the last four <laughs> years. And um, so, yeah, I, and now I, I'm first generation college, effectively. My mom went to college while she was raising my brother and I. Um, but uh, I didn't know what I was doing. Right. So I didn't know that there was I, I knew I wanted to be a theoretical physicist, but I didn't know that how the professor thing worked. Mm -hmm. I don't think I knew how the professor thing worked until, quite frankly, I was about halfway through grad school. Mm -hmm. And I, then, I think I'm starting to know now. Well, and then <laughs> I have to say, 
every year of the last 11, I've learned a little more about how the right. professor things work. Because if I would have gone back to grad school, Chris, and said, guess what additional things you get to do, get to do as a professor. Uh, stick, stick, stick. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know if um, 25, 26 year old Chris would have been as a home. All right. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he would have. I, I, I don't know, but it's uh, you're right. Things change. Mm -hmm. And, and I think one of the things that um, sometimes academics do that's a bit dangerous is they come, they get, they get tenure and they they become somewhat complacent and they think of themselves and i guess i'll say it as out of the job market right and i try to avoid that thinking as much as possible not that i'm on the market right now but i want to make sure that if an opportunity arises mm -hmm. you know i can take advantage of it as opposed to sort of a complacency that i have seen in my career at least um sometimes build up saying you know well I'm here now. I've got tenure. I'm here forever. Right. Well, I and also think the easier it is to move, the easier it is to stay. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. But I mean, that, that goes with the broader theme. You should not have a goal of getting tenure. Um, I think that gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this thing that oh, I've spent, you know, all these years, grad school, postdocs, uh, my first number of years on the job, maybe even your second job for some people. Um, and then I got tenure. Ten years for the week. But then you, I mean, there is a statement of, I mean, this is a goal and it becomes, I think, a giant letdown because your world is not really any better post-tenure. Yes, you have some level of job security, but I'll promise you that's not perfect job security. No. Uh, we, I've seen where they can get rid of tenure cases either with tenure review they'll institute or option B, the easier option, is to fold the department. Yep. We're having an issue about this. Let's get rid of the department. We're not getting rid of you personally. We're getting rid of all of these jobs. So don't treat tenure as the end well, goal. I know, uh, at least Stephen and I, we've seen that at our own institution where half the departments of a college were just gone. Mm -hmm. Tenure's gone. You know, yep. the department, you have no tenure. You're yep. on your ass, man. Oh, you know, th there have been schools that recently have been closing. Mm -hmm. right? That's another place, yeah. You know, um, you have... The department's folding the state could come in and say, you know what? And we saw this in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, having a physics department here and a physics department there, uh, it's too redundant. You yeah. know, we probably only need two of them in the state or whatever. I don't know. I just made that number up. But, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> so. Well, Tulane, Tulane post Hurricane Katrina said this is a natural disaster. We are no longer bound by the contracts that are associated with tenure. And they folded tenure across their entire business school post Katrina. And they said, let's do it again. They folded all of them and began again. So it shouldn't be your goal. Uh, it should be something that's nice and you should, you know, enjoy yourself however you enjoy yourself post tenure. But if your goal is tenure, you don't see that next plan. You don't see where you're going. And as you said, Chris, looking for the next job, or at least being aware of the next job, allows you to plan for not just making your department happy, and which is what often gets you tenure, but making the field happy which gets you other jobs or at least makes you satisfied within your job. If you're doing things that make you happy and your department doesn't respect that, they're not happy with you doing these things, it's probably a really bad fit. You well, know, if your goal is tenure, you're going to end up a terminal associate. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You know, not go anywhere. And if your end goal well, is you're going to debt it yeah. in your pay if nothing yeah. else. Right. <laughs> yeah. If that's your end goal is tenure. I mean, tenure should always be a goal. Like you get this job. I want to get tenure. Right. That's, that's, that's a goal, but it's not oh, the it's end tenure track game. job. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a tenure track job, but it's not the end game. Um, if you look at the end game, that's where you fall into the terminal associate or or some institutions that don't necessarily tie mm -hmm. a promotion with tenure. And yep. then you're in the position of a terminal assistant. Yep. Still amazes me that that exists. Yeah. You can do both sides. You can do associate without tenure. You can do assistant uh, with tenure. Um, and these are, you know, again, we're talking from a very American point of view here, uh, you know, different uh, abroad are, are very different views on this stuff. I know within the Netherlands, for example, tenure and promotion are very different experiences. Tenure is something based on your academic achievement and promotion in many respects is based on somebody dying. Um, they have a set number of slots and when somebody dies or leaves the college in one way or another, those slots, actually it's the university level, I believe those slots are up for grabs. So you could be 
the most productive assistant professor in the world. But if there are no associate slots, you're not getting an associate. Wow. That's an interesting, uh, that could be an interesting work culture. <laughs> well, I mean, I know people who have taken, who've, who've given up tenure to go to a different college or different university solely because there was a pathing. So they got associate without tenure, whereas they were assistant with tenure somewhere else because they wanted that rank. Or, or you do it just to hop institutions. Yeah. Yeah. It's the whole institution hopping game, trying to move from one level to another level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a very weird field. Yep. So, and this is just our narrow perspectives of, science and business you yeah. can't imagine the word crap that goes on in yeah. some of the others yeah. oh yeah and, and we understand that it's it's different across the board and, and your experience will vary uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, this, in this career path i don't think there is honestly you know we talked about Stephen as being sort of the more typical mm -hmm. or if you will right i don't think there really is a typical um path necessarily um there i think they're frequently taken steps mm -hmm. But I think everyone's sort of path through the yeah. the culture of academia is is, is odd, mm -hmm. and and a lot of times it's just being in the right place at the right time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we like yeah, just the culture. The cultures are so radically different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I only have what three real schools to compare because my undergrad, you know, I wasn't paying any attention to you know. <laughs> that um, was, yeah. So I I went to an extremely left-leaning liberal PhD program in university. And now I'm at a, currently at an extremely conservative, you know, uh, institution and university with a very conservative culture. I don't mean conservative is like politically conservative, but just socially and culturally conservative. And now I'm going to an incredibly diverse, very different, you know, school that's very state as opposed to the state school I'm at now, which is not state. Um, and just the cultures between the places are just insane. So, yeah, if you in my PhD program, someone called you doctor or something because you had a PhD and everybody laughed their ass off. Mm -hmm. right. You know, what are you? You're not a real doctor. Uh, at the one I'm at currently now, you don't do it. And, like, people get super offended. So I'm always saying, well, don't get sick. <laughs> Students will call me, you know, Dr. Macy. It's just like, well, whatever. Yeah. And I do like tweaking my fellow professors will get all uppity about it and she's like yeah you got one doctorate yeah i got two shut up <laughs> what's this crap because yeah, some of us take ourselves way too serious that that's a topic for another show it really yeah. is it really is <laughs> academic yeah. ego yeah yeah <laughs> navigating egos yeah oh yeah it's hurting so, cats mm -hmm. yeah yeah, yeah. So what we plan to be a half hour show has a typical Oops. academic fashion <laughs> overshot that time slot. Uh, but that's okay. Hey, we haven't gone to faculty meeting levels no, yet. That is another, that's a series of shows right there. So uh, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up um, this episode of A Professor's Life, the first episode of Professor's Life. Please, uh, if you liked what um, you saw or heard, please uh, click like in YouTube or subscribe. Subscribe in iTunes. Give us a review. Let us know what we're doing well. Let us know what we're not doing so well. But remember, it's a first episode, and we have feelings too. So please. <laughs> I don't know. We're professors. Do you really have feelings? I don't. I don't. Yeah. Uh, we're looking for constructive criticism. Yeah, right. uh, like I tell my students, don't <laughs> my class sucks. Tell me my class sucks because that's. <laughs> All we right. will do the review process as well. You can give us feedback. Then we will provide a 50-page response to your feedback about why you're wrong. We can go that fast. <laughs> Again, this is academia. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, for, uh, for Robert and Stephen, uh, I will say good night or good day.